This is a controversial question. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name's Chris. I'm a final year international medical student and I make videos about my IMG journey. In the last video, I asked you guys to leave some comments or questions. If there's anything you want me to answer and in this video, I'm gonna answer them. Uh, so let's get started. So, Shake asks, is volunteer work, research, publications mandatory in the CV during the match because I didn't participate in these? Okay, Shake, I would say it depends on the specialty that you're applying to. I wouldn't say that research is mandatory, but it's definitely a nice plus and it's going to set, set you apart from other applicants that don't have research. And it also depends on what kind of specialty you're interested in. If you're interested in something more competitive, like dermatology or plastic surgery, then yes, research matters more. But if you're interested in something like internal medicine, then research matters less. But if you have the opportunity to do it, then you should definitely go ahead. I would definitely say more research is better than less but the quality of the research also matters. The research that you engage in will come up as a topic for a question in your interview for a residency. Um, so make sure that whatever you engage in is something that you actually enjoy. We can also answer this question by looking at the NRMP match data and we can look at dermatology and you can see the number of people that matched into the specialty with a score of uh, whatever, step one score. So 156 people had a score of 220 to 229, and they had a 60% match rate. But if I change the number of research experiences to no research experience, you can see that instead of having a 60% match rate, it falls to about 25%. And we've got only eight people here, so it's a very small sample size. So you can see that having less research is important and it does decrease your chance of matching in a competitive specialty like dermatology. But if I increase the amount of research to 10 or less, you can see, wow, that a lot more people have the research but you can also see that the number of people that match is about, the rate is about 60%. But if I increase the number of publications in dermatology to over 25, you can see that the match rate doesn't change very much. There is diminishing returns with regards to the amount of research you're gonna do. If you have no research, that's probably gonna hurt you in terms of your application. If you have up to 10 publications, then that will definitely help you match. But if you have between 10 and 20 publications, it doesn't significantly change your chance of matching. Um, so I think this is interesting to talk about with regards to matching to competitive specialties. Okay, great. So Makul Doshi asks, is it possible for an IMG to match into dermatology? Okay, so this is a controversial question. Again, we can use the NRMP match data to answer this question. If we go into dermatology here, can actually change by applicant type. So you can see the chance of matching is about 60%, but if we change the applicant type, to non-US IMG or US IMG, you can see that the match rate is significantly lower. So as, as opposed to being 60%, it's 40% or even as low as 27%. It's definitely harder to match into a competitive specialty if you're an IMG. But, and I think the important thing to remember is statistics apply to populations, not people. All this means is that on average, the number of people with a 230 that matched was 27%. But this doesn't tell you anything about the other parts of their application. How many contacts did they have in that specialty? Did they do US clinical experience? Did they do a few research years to build contacts in the specialty? Did they go and present at international conferences? Did they build connections with dermatologists in America and ask them for letters of recommendation? Uh, for when they applied into the specialty. So you can see there's a lot of things that also go into the process of applying as a specialty. You can see that it's definitely difficult to apply and it's definitely difficult to match. But what I would say is that this statistic doesn't apply to you if you are dedicated. I definitely think it's possible for an IMG to match into something competitive like dermatology. Doc on the clock asks, Hey, can you please share which NBMEs are good, which ones to focus on? So, hey Doc on the clock. I think the which specific NBMEs doesn't matter as much as the number of NBMEs you do. So I did NBME 27, 28, 29, and 30. So that was four. And I also did UWorld 1 and UWorld 2. I don't really have any recommendations other than take UWorld 1 at the very beginning before you've done any prep so you can see how bad you are basically. Uh, and then save UWorld self-assessment 2 for like a week or two before your test to give you a good idea of where you're at. I wouldn't say you need to focus on any specific one. 
Afro D-U-T, I hope I'm saying that correctly, uh, says, Hi, I'm an IMG from Bangladesh, uh, and I graduated around four years ago. Do you recommend Kaplan for someone like me? Okay, she's, caught, she's talking about the Kaplan uh, Lecture Notes book series, uh, which I made a video on here. I'm going to link it just so you can uh, click that if you're interested. But yes, so this is an interesting question. In my previous video, I said that you shouldn't really do Kaplan unless you have enough time to go through it, and I stand by that. I think if you have one or even two years to do Kaplan, you you'll need that much time to go through it thoroughly. But I actually, for someone like this, who has probably, they graduated four years ago, so they probably have a weaker base knowledge, that's probably worth it for you to do the Kaplan lecture notes because, and the Kaplan notes will allow you to rebuild your basic science knowledge. But for everyone else, I wouldn't really recommend you use it. This is a very specific circumstance. D. Rana asks, when you say start a world ASAP, do you mean alongside studying? Or do we start the QBank at the same time? Do we use the QBank only when we start prepping for USMLE or a few months after starting your prep for the USMLE? And also she asks, wouldn't we run out of questions and memorize the answer? Okay, essentially my recommendation is if you're in a six year program and let's say you're a first year medical student, starting a QBank for you right now is probably gonna be difficult. You won't be able to start UWorld because it will be too tough for you, but you can start the USMLE RX QBank. And then later, when you're at the end of your second year or the beginning of your third year, and you have a bit more clinical knowledge, then you can move on to UWorld and use that for your USMLE prep. As soon as you've started thinking about taking USMLE step one, I think you should start a QBank, whatever QBank that is. Um, and the reason why I say that is it's much more effective to answer practice questions and then use those practice questions to go back to your first aid, your Kaplan, your Boards and Beyond, and then read into the topic. And I think the earlier that you start a QBank, the better you will do on step one. I really truly believe that. Um, and the other question was, wouldn't we run out of questions? So the UWorld Step 1 QBank has 3,600 questions, and the AM Boss QBank has 2,190 questions. So if you add that up, if you did a block of 40, seven days a week, every single day, no days off, it would take you almost six months to complete. Um, and you are not going to be doing a block every single day, seven days a week, every single day. You're just not going to. But you can do something more realistic, like a block a day, five times a week. It would take you 210 calendar days to complete, okay? So that's like two thirds of a year to complete it. So basically, all you need to know is that you won't run out of questions. You should not use that as a reason why you shouldn't be doing questions. If you finished UWorld Step 1, you should move to a different QBank like AM Boss or USMLE RX. Okay, great. So Mona asks, thanks for your effort in the videos. Thank you very much, Mona. I appreciate it. I'm in the beginning of my second year. Is this an appropriate time to start studying for Step 1? So I personally think that yes, you can really start studying for Step 1, I would say. If you're in a six-year curriculum, towards the end of your second year or the beginning of your third year is a good time to start because you want to build enough basic science knowledge to be able to expand and start a QBank like USMLE RX. Um, so yes, uh, I would say it's a bit early for you now, but towards the end of your second year, I would say go for it. Preet Oi asks, I hope I'm saying that correctly, do you recommend Kaplan, Boards and Beyond, or any of the high yield resources to someone who just began med school and is a USMLE aspirant? If not, what do you recommend for building a strong base? So, I personally believe that the best way to build a strong base is to really focus as much as you can on your medical school curriculum. If you really engage with your medical school and you get straight A's and you do really, really, really well, uh, you're going to have a really strong base to build your USMLE prep on top of. I think it's a mistake to, to start your USMLE prep too early because you're, you don't have enough broad of a knowledge to start focusing in on step one prep. What you can do early in your first year, if you're really serious about step one, and this is what I did, I actually started watching the Pathoma lecture series and I started watching Sketchy. And I'm really happy I did that because I got it over with nice and early. And then I watched it again, closer to my USMLE prep. Um, so you can do that if you're really eager. Uh, but I would say focus on the fundamentals, focus on your med school curriculum, and then start a QBank later if you're really, really eager. 
UK, Mohammed asks a lot of questions, but he actually specifically asked, is it worth working hard for the USMLE step one now that it's pass fail? Um, and I would say 100% yes. Despite the fact that USMLE step one is now pass fail, the, the thing is I'm studying for step two now, and there is a lot of overlap between step one and step two. And step two is still a numbered score, and you want to do really well on step two. So it makes sense to put in lots and lots of effort towards step one, because we know from the statistics that people who do really well on step one go on to do really well on step two. Work as hard as you can for step one, and it will make the process of studying for step two much easier. All right, guys, I, I hope I answered all of your questions. I just wanted to thank you guys for watching the videos and liking and subscribing to the channel. Um, I stopped uploading in September of last year, and since then, I think the channel doubled in size from 500 subscribers to 1,000 subscribers, and I, I, that honestly blows my mind. Uh, I have no idea why you guys are all here listening to my ramblings, uh, but I hope that I'm helping some of you guys out there. At least I like to think I am. So I'll keep what, making these videos if you guys keep watching. And I wanted to give back to you guys. So we're gonna be doing a giveaway uh, of this Kaplan Lecture Notes series from 2018. Wow, ooh, wow. So I personally didn't get any value from these, which you'll know if you watched this video up here. Um, but there are some people, like we've just mentioned, that these books I think could be really valuable for. So if you're interested in winning the giveaway, just click the link in the description down below uh, and get as many entries as you want. So thank you guys, and I'll see you in the next one.